This is the uh, first Sunday of the wonderful season of Advent. Uh, this is a wonderful time to be in the church and be a part of the church. We have the Advent wreath there before you. We'll be lighting it this morning during our, our worship service. Notice also in your bulletin there's an insert pertaining to uh, Poinsettias. So if you're interested and if we are sure you are, many of you are, please uh, uh, make use of that uh, don a donation that you might make to the church. And also, those are your poinsettias that you'll take home on Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Eve communion service. And we do still plan to have that as of now. And uh, we have a wonderful, safe way of doing it. And so hopefully it will work out for everyone that will participate Christmas Eve in a communion service. Confirmation class has resumed during the season of Advent. We started during the season of Lent. Concluding during Advent. We started out with three children and we're concluding with one. And it's been a difficult year for a lot of us in a lot of different ways. Please be in prayer for the for all of our youth, youth and children. And uh, Lillian Dunn will this next Sunday hopefully be baptized and confirmed as a member of the church coming through the confirmation class. The uh, uh, Advent devotional calendars are in the north X of the church. Please pick one up at your leisure. These are for you. It starts to today, and it will carry you through till Christmas Eve. It's a wonderful reading for every day during the season of Advent. Please take one. It is for you. It's been made available through a generous church member. We we'll appreciate that. Notice also uh, food pantry sign up. I wanted just to mention something about food pantry. Statistics mean a lot to a lot of us, and for some it doesn't mean much. But here's a few statistics that you might be interested in. I get this information monthly, but maybe you don't get this information that I have, so I want to share it with you. Uh, for the month of November, for instance, last, last Saturday and the month, we distributed 393 boxes from the Fulton Methodist Church Food Pantry, okay? We, that fed uh, the families, and the, the, as many as 836 people in those families that we just mentioned, that many boxes fed those people. Here's something you don't always hear. We have 131 volunteers that work during the month of November. That's a lot. 131 people participated as volunteers, equivalent to 177 volunteer hours. So if you look at the volunteers and the hours, no one has to, a few people work more than others, of course, but no one has to work many hours. So if you ever want to volunteer, think about that statistic. Out of 131 working in the month of November, it is what people 177 hours. No one had to work too long for really much. So that's a, that's a statistic I wanted to share with you, and uh, hopefully you'll know a little more about the food pantry. Our Wednesday activities are, as usual, the Hamilton Small Group on Wednesday afternoon is going to discontinue temporarily and start back up at the first of the year. just want to share that information with you also. To uh, tomorrow night, there will be a special uh, uh, small groups meeting tomorrow night for people that have experienced grief this year or even previous years. Helping you through the holiday season, we will meeting here tomorrow night at the Brook Center, starting at 4, concluding at 5.30, just for, for a seminar dealing with grief. That's for those of you that would like to participate in. Gingerbread houses, the youth and the children participate in this. They do a great job that week the 13th. And that, way, that day, by the way, we have an infant baptism schedule. Uh, the youth are going to have a lock in, so keep that in mind. That information is in the bulletin, and uh, uh, that very brave youth director we've got to go into the lock in. Then the Heaven Sunday School class will be in picking up a uh, used duffel bags. This will be to help foster care uh, missions in Interlumpa County. So keep that in mind also if your children have a, a slightly used duffel bag that could be shared. All right.
We've made our way through these announcements and thank you for uh, listening to them and we appreciate you for coming out and for you that are online watching. Here's another bit of information. This is very, very important. The folks that uh, every Sunday count the money after you've made your contributions, as well as the church treasurer, reminded me to make this announcement. Very important. Usually in the back of the church and here there are two offering plates. Plate. One is an offering plate, and the other one is a basket. You know by definition the basket is for the dollars, for missions. The offering plate is for our special, our regular Sunday morning offering. I understand as you make your exit out of the church, it doesn't really matter which one you put it in for some of us, because just as long as the church gets it, that's all that's important. But it makes a difference. <laughs> The treasurer asked me to make that clear. It does make a difference if you put your contribution in the basket, it goes to the dollar submission. If you put it in the offering plate, it goes to the church offering. Just wanted to clarify that. Again, it might not make much difference to you as you leave, but it does for the sake of the church. All right. Thank you.
God is good. And all the time. Let's pray. Almighty God, never ask Him, Father. It is your will to restore all things to Christ, whom you have appointed priest forever and ruler of creation. Grant that all the people of the earth, now divided by the power of sin, may be united under the glorious and gentle rule of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. And in the name of Jesus Christ, let his church say, Amen. Please stand for the celebration of the 196th Amendment Assembly. Please stand for the
first Sunday of the Christian year, Advent. Do you know what this is called? An Advent wreath. Advent wreath. That's, that's what it's called. That's the name of it. It's a very special wreath that we have in the church. There's uh, several things I want you to think about as you look at this. And I love to do this on the first Sunday of Advent every year. You may remember me talking about it last year a little bit. You do. This is the first Sunday. Notice, notice the greenery. The greenery. That represents everlasting life. Evergreen. That's why we put the green greenery out during the season of Advent. For everlasting life. Notice the shape of this wreath. What shape is it? the shape of the earth. The circle is just beautiful. Then we have these purple candles. Now the reason for the purple is uh, actually historically it's been for penitence. Now penitence is, uh, is, is someone feeling sorry for their sins. That's what penitence is. Now repentance is doing something about it. Okay? But penitence and this rose color now, that's for joy. That's for the, 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 week, the third Sunday, and it's called the uh, candle of, of joy. The center candle, what color is that? And who does that represent? Jesus. Jesus. And we light that on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. All right? We talked about this candle being the candle for joy. Every candle really represents something special. Today, it represents Hope. That's on the front right here. This rhyme. Hope for the day. Then a little bit of candle for love, candle for joy, and candle for peace. We'll light all four of them during the season of Advent. All right. I think it's important that we just share what, uh, with you the Advent wreath, what it's about, and why we use it. It's a tradition. The tradition can be pretty good if it's a good tradition. Do you know we all are very special? Well, you know that I knew you did. You're quite lovely. We appreciate you so much. Let's have a little prayer. God, our Father, we ask you to bless us on these dear children that meet here on these steps. God bless them. Be with them through this week and their parents. Just protect them, comfort them, and give them the security that comes from you, gracious God. And help us always to be thankful. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Let's pray for a moment.
we, we all fade like the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name, who attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. Now this is the word of God for the people of God, and thanks be to God. I want to start off by telling you this kind of frivolous story. It's kind of a, some of you might like it, some of you might not. But if you, uh, it, it's an interesting story, I think. It's kind of cute. About the two guys that are playing golf. Okay? One of them is the local priest, the Christian priest in the local church. The other guy is the local noted town reprobate. He's a scoundrel. He's a bad guy. Okay? These two people are out on the golf course playing golf. They get to the first hole, and at the first hole, the, uh, the scoundrel gets up on the green to putt and misses three short little putts. Three. And he starts, he wasn't cursing, he was cussing. He was, he was, he was, how, how can I miss that? My goodness, so short. How could I miss it? Blankety blank, 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 stomping, kicking, throwing his golf club down. How could I miss such a short shot? And uh, the priest, listening to all this, said, Look, if you don't straighten up, God's going to strike you down. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right, priest. So they go on. They ride on, do a few more holes of golf, and then they get to about the third or fifth hole. It does the same thing. He, he misses three short putts. And then he goes into a tirade again. He throws the golf club down, picks it up, and then throws it in the lake. He's swearing, cussing. How could I? How could I miss such a short shot? I, I missed. I didn't. How could I do that? And all of a sudden, a little cloud, dark, looming cloud, just came off with the golf course and settled right over them, right there. And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt came out of that cloud and Hit the priest and burn him to a crisp. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, How could I miss? I was aiming at the other one. How could this happen? How could I miss? <laughs> now that's a frivolous story. It's a terrible story, as a matter of fact. But the point that I want to make with that story, I think, is kind of simple and good. The point is that God is big enough to love us. God is big enough to love Isaiah. Even when he swears and says, God, why don't you come down and straighten this mess out? We're in a mess, God. Whether we're in Babylon, suffering, or whether we're in Jerusalem in the midst of sin, why don't you come down and straighten this mess out? God understands our anger. God's big enough to do that. When we cry out, when our child is hurting, God, why don't you do something? We need you to. God understands. Isaiah's desperate plea was the result of the helplessness of the children of Israel. In the midst of their great suffering, in the midst of their great sinfulness. Let's talk about the suffering aspect for the first point here. The people of Israel have known great suffering. In Isaiah's time, the children of Israel were under great suffering. In Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, and all the wicked kings of Babylon, taken into exile. And, and poor old Isaiah was so cruelly treated, talking about suffering, when they actually put him to death, they sawed him in half. That's the story. They killed Isaiah. But whether we're talking about the suffering of the children of Israel in ancient antiquity, or whether we're talking about the modern suffering of the Israelites, yet there are special people. The Bible tells us this. All through the scripture, there are special people with a special relationship with God. They're called the chosen people. The people of God. Here's a bit of trivia you might find interesting. When Columbus sailed to this new
new world in, what was it, 1492, when he sailed here, this is interesting, he had two Hebrew-speaking people aboard one of the ships. Nita, Pinta, or Santa Maria. He had two, that must have been Jews, Jewish people, aboard the ship. Now, why did he do this? The reason is that the Hebrew language is a very old, ancient language. And Columbus, re Columbus reasoned in his mind that if I, we go to the West Indies or someplace else that we're going for, if we find a very primitive people, surely they will understand the language of God. The Hebrew language has always been called the language of God. It has been. It's been called that. And that's why he carried with him two Hebrew-speaking children of Israel with him. The term God's chosen people has been very difficult to reconcile over the centuries. Even the way they were treated in Isaiah's day, the way they were treated even since Christ's time, the Spanish Inquisition of the Middle Ages and all of the terrible plight that the Jewish people have gone through, not to mention last century, the Holocaust and all that they experienced through that terrible catastrophe. But, which of us, in our own time of facing enormous problems, have not asked God to come down and straighten out this whole mess? In our lifetime, just like Isaiah was saying, why don't you come down, God, and straighten this out? Aren't we still saying that today? And then you might run across people that have, have this idea, well, what mess? What mess? What are you talking about? Everything's going along pretty good. It may be for you. You may feel that what mess? But some of us might think this, the world is in a pretty big mess if you see what's going on. If you were asking God to come down and straighten out this mess, what would you put on your list? Would you make a list? You know, you make a list for Christmas. Would we make a list of things that we might like for God to do if He came down in person to straighten all this out? Think about it. Think about that. Make your list. We might come back to that in a few moments. Why don't you just come down? And this was the first concern the children of Israel that were suffering in a great terrible way. Why don't you come down, Lord, and just straighten out this mess? And we could say the same thing today. But of course, if you do, you're talking about the second coming, the second advent. Why don't you come down and straighten out this mess? The second point has to do with sinfulness. The sinfulness of the people. The uh, verses 5b and 6a go like this. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid your face, we transgress. We have all become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous deeds are like filthy cloth. Even the best we do, we come short. We fall short. More than any other faith that there ever has been, or religion, the Jewish faith is one of doing the right. I want you to think about that with me. You might say, no, that's Christianity. Yes, Christianity is about doing the right. But the Jewish faith, the Hebrew children, the Old Testament has the law. And they're built around the law. And the law is very important when you understand the coming of the Messiah, Advent, and all that goes with it. The Jewish faith more than any other faith is one of doing right. They have the law. I can't begin to tell you how important the law was and how important the law is. We all personally, I think the giving of the Ten Commandments and law itself was the beginning of civilization. That's Philip's take on it. I think the law was so important to the children of Israel when they accepted it, when they received it from God on Mount Sinai through Moses, 
That was the beginning of civilization when man realized, humanity realized that there are rights and wrongs. That when we transgress against God's rule or law, we, we mess up. And, the, and, and think about life without law. Where would we be? We would be in total darkness. It would be chaos, wouldn't it? Imagine, imagine this red light right down here. If we just get away with it, just put it away, it wasn't there anymore. We might successfully go through that intersection a lot of times. But that red light is there for a reason. It's the law. It says stop when you see it. And that's what it means. It saves lives. And the law has always functioned that way. Transgress against the law. There are results. The law was given to the children of Israel to bring light into the darkness, darkened world. That's how God did it to the children of Israel. He did this. God did this before the temple in Jerusalem. He did it before the, uh, they became a homeland or a place called Israel. This was the, their first mission, that of the children of Israel, to be people of the law. Humanity was created to live in perfect harmony with God. I love the Genesis story at this point. Uh, humanity was created, and here's a, here's a take on it. You don't hear a minister say too often this, but if you believe in the Genesis story literally, or you believe in it figuratively, it's still the same lesson. It really is. It's the very basic same lesson. Humanity was created in perfection. Humanity was created to walk with God and talk with God in the cool of the day. Humanity was, was, was created for God in a very special way, in a very perfect heaven on earth. Right? It was the garden. It was the heaven on earth. But what happened? In the same book of Isaiah, there's a reference to what happened way back before even recorded history. The passage says, O Lucifer, son of the morning, why are you cast down to this earth? Satan crept into the garden. They only had one commandment. They only had one law they had to keep in that garden. Don't eat that fruit. That was the law. The forbidden fruit. Don't eat it. They could not keep that law. Sin crept in. And there had to be an answer to this, and this is what fulfilled, this is why the law came into existence in such a powerful way with the children of Israel. It brought civilization to an otherwise uncivilized world. Law was created. It was uh, 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 just essential for God to do this. Law was given to bring light into darkness. And then in the fullness of time, we as Christians maintain this. That Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And if law brought light into the world, you can only imagine how much enlightening or how much light the Messiah brings. Jesus, that brings light into total darkness. We don't even know, we can't even imagine the darkness of humanity prior to Jesus. Here were God's people uh, in Isaiah's passage with dirty hands and impure hearts. These were the children of Israel. Does that sound kind of like modern humanity today? I don't know. We're certainly not perfect, are we? I guess we could be contortionists patting ourselves on the back. But we don't need to do that either. I think one of our problems today is in the modern culture, and this message, this text is just for the modern world just as much as it is for ancient Israel, is that it's okay if you don't get caught. You know, that's the kind of immorality we deal with today. It's okay, wink, wink, nod, nod, if you don't get caught. It's okay to break the speed limit if you don't get caught. It's okay to do this or that if you don't get caught. I think of the three boys that were skipping school. One, one morning, they were just decided they'd go to one of the boys' house. He opened his house up to him. 
these three boys went over and they spent the day uh, playing cards and drinking beer. It was that, their day. It was a day they took off, and that's what they did. Had the shades rolled up, and they were spending the day doing that. Well, they got caught because they had the shades up. And the uh, next day at school, they had to account for themselves. So the first one was brought into the principal's office, and he reprimands him good, saying, what got into you? What were you thinking? You're the Baptist preacher, son. What got into you for doing this? What, what were you thinking? He said, I don't know. I don't know. So the principal says, well, go on to class. Then the next boy comes in and says, principal does the same thing. Well, what got into you? What were you thinking? You're the Methodist preacher's son. What were you doing that for? What got into you? He said, I don't know. Principal says, well, go on to your class. Then the third boy came in, and it was his house that they were playing the cards in. And, uh, and the principal did the same thing. What got into you? What were you thinking? What were you thinking to pulling those guys out and that, doing all that yesterday? And he said, I was thinking I should have pulled shades. <laughs> well, is that where we are in our modern culture when it comes to immorality? That sounds pretty close, doesn't it? No harm, no foul. Do we teach our children that? It's okay if you don't get caught. If you don't get caught, it's all right. Well, here's something. You can write this down. I don't know if it's original, but I like to think it's original with me. It's so simple. Write it down because it's so important. It's this. Right is right, even if no one is right. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is wrong. That's a fact. Whether it's ancient Israel or modern United States, the power of sin destroys. And by the way, sin is sin. You want, immorality is immorality. Some people distinguish, you want to distinguish it. This is worse than that. Well, and I, I've always, I always use this illustration. Really, when it comes to immorality, sin, or, or, or whatever, do you think the homosexual adulterer is going to be, be punished harsher than the heterosexual adulterer? Do you think? And if you want to answer that question, then you may have more problems than either one of those individuals. You know, personally, I'm going to leave that kind of judgment stuff up to God. Okay? Immorality is immorality. And it's not very pretty. Sin destroys. It destroys health. It destroys home. It destroys weaknesses. It destroys nations, governments, lands, and it impedes growth in all of the aforementioned areas. Rarely do people listen to God until it's too late. Maybe that was Israel's problem when they start crying out, why don't you come down? Maybe that's our problem today when we cry, Lord, why don't you come down? Straighten this mess out. And the Lord says, I've been here all along. Where have you been? I've been here all the time. Where have you been? Now you're calling on me. That was Israel's problem. <laughs> One of the boys I grew up with at school, his daddy got a new car, and he put too many miles on it one Friday night. So Saturday morning, he was backing it around his, his, his neighborhood, trying to run the miles back off of it. I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if you can do that or not, but he tried. Isaiah saw Israel had drifted too far off. And its only hope was for God to come down. All right. That Isaiah passage is pre-Jesus. The answer here is that God has come down. And Advent is the answer. Jesus is the answer. God has come down to a suffering and sinful world. You know, there would really be no immorality. There would be no starvation. There would be no evil. There would be no problems in the world if the world understood that God has come down. That's the problem. The world has not accepted 
and the world does not understand. Just because someone wants to celebrate Christmas doesn't mean that they understand that God has come down to this world. Think about what could be on this earth if we realize collectively as the people of the world that God is with us, when the, in the midst of us, that God has come down. Your list that you made a few minutes ago, what would we change? What could we be if we all realize that God has come down? Well, He has come down, but the world is yet to receive Him. I wish the world had received Him and has received Him, but obviously it has not. What He offers is Himself. Himself alone. Like the Advent candles. We want hope. Our hope is in Jesus. That's the candle of today. You want peace? Peace is in Jesus. You want love? Love is in Christ. You want joy? Joy is in Christ. The problem is we want these things, but many people don't want Christ. I, I, I hesitate to say that to you because I do believe you're part of the group that does want Christ. But there's a world of people that are obviously ashamed to even be affiliated with Christ. They love the word Christmas. Notice this. Do this this year, the rest of this time between now and Christmas. I've been doing it for a week now, two weeks. And I've seen it. If you watch the newspaper, look at the newspaper, listen to the announcers on the news, uh, the, even the movies that are shown, everything, notice how people play down the word Christmas. I'm not trying to make any points. I'm just trying to want you to obviously watch it. Watch for that. And the reason is so simple. Christmas has Christ in it. That's it. It's just a problem with many in the world today. Even the great tragedy is many Christians want to play the word now. That's the problem. Christ has come down. But the world's not received a world without suffering, a world without sin, that's when we pray for the second coming of Christ, when there will be peace on earth. I assure you there will be peace on earth when Christ comes again. The, the, the Isaiah's passage that deals with the lamb and the lion lying down together, eating straw like the ox, and people beating their sores into plowshares and pruning hooks, there will be peace. It might be a forced peace, but there will be peace when the Prince of Peace comes back. We're still under the grace of Christ's first coming, and that's what we're celebrating. The healing and the reconciling work that's done in the name of God is through us in the name of Christ, Jesus Christ. This is our focus, the one that's brought light into the world of darkness. Why don't you come down, Isaiah says. Come down and straighten this mess out. Well, through Jesus, God has come down. Isaiah's prayer was answered. Through Jesus. And this is why we celebrate the hope candle on the first Sunday of Advent. It's about hope. It's, it's, it's so good. It's so wholesome to focus on the good things that are before us. Not not the negatives, but the good, and realizing that salvation comes through Christ, who saves our immortal souls, who has saved our parents before us, and who will save our children after us. Jesus is the only answer. Jesus Christ, who brought light into the world of darkness. We don't have to cry out, come down, Lord. He's here. Let's just plug into the presence of Christ might not mean that all of our problems disappear, but it means that someone's with us to go through the problems, which is everything, isn't it? Let's have a closing and invitation on him, and may God have God's way with you. Please stand for the hymn of invitation, number 211.
sanctify you and give you peace now.